look through the Hebrew names of God, we come in this passage to a name, Jehovah Kadesh, the God who sanctifies. It says there in verse 13, I, the Lord, sanctify you. The Lord who sanctified. The Lord who sets apart. The Lord who cleanses. The Lord who purifies. This is the, the first mention of this name being revealed in the Bible. And if you notice the link, uh, the context in which it's revealed, it's revealed in a reminder to keep the Sabbath. Verse 13, above all you shall keep my Sabbaths. Verse 14, you shall keep the Sabbath. So this is a reference back to you know, a few chapters earlier in Exodus chapter 20, when Moses goes up the mountain and receives the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments that we see in our text here, verse 18, it says uh, that God had given to Moses when he'd finished speaking with him on the Mount Sinai the two tablets of the testimony tablets of stone written with the finger of God. So on the mountain, Moses received a whole load of laws. But there were some specific laws, what we call the Ten Commandments, which weren't just spoken by God and written down by Moses, but it actually says were written on stone tablets by the finger of God. And the reference here is to the Fourth Commandment. That's written there on these tablets. Let me remind you of it. Exodus 20. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock. It's not stack. Stock, sorry. Or the sojourner who is in your gates. Repeated again in Deuteronomy chapter 5. In revealing the name Jehovah Kadesh, God reveals in this text three reasons why Israel were to keep one day in seven holy, the last day of the week holy and set apart for the Lord. He gives three reasons. The three reasons are. God's creation, God's redemption, and we'll look firstly at God's holiness. Verse 14, you shall keep the Sabbath because it is holy for you. In Exodus 19 to 31, we've, we've seen that God's people are a holy people, they're a called out people. These laws that God's given is, is because God's chosen them out of all the nations. He's set them apart. He's made them holy. He's, he's chosen them. He's redeemed them. He's brought them out. And now he's showing them what it looks like to, to live as a holy people. This, the Sabbath is holy to them because God is holy to them. These people had had their eyes open to see who God was, to actually experience God, to, to see something of the power and the majesty of God. A great privilege. And we are the same. The world's going around and they, they don't really think about God. They don't particularly care about God. But we're a holy people. God's chosen us and he's called us and he's set us apart. He's brought us here today because we're a holy people. And we are here today because we know that God is holy, that, that this time together we know is holy. It's precious. You could have been at home doing all sorts of things, but you chose to come here because we're a holy people and we know that we're coming before a holy God. God truly is holy. Jehovah is set apart the, you know, the Bible speaks clearly that there's no other gods beside him. No one else is like him. You know, you've got gods in the Bible with a small g. But there's no one like Almighty God. 
There's no one like him. This is the very essence of, of who God is. His most fundamental characteristic is one of holiness. People say, yeah, but God is love. You know, it's clearly stated, God is love. But God only expresses his love because of his holiness. His holiness was there, but because sin came into the world, he then expresses his love by sending his son. But the very core of God is holiness. He's set apart. He's different from us. He's not like us in that regard. And when we read the Old Testament, the great lesson really for the people of Israel is to understand that God is holy. And to understand how a sinful people can come close, how they can relate to a God who is holy. This is the whole purpose of the laws. And so we see in, in the, the Ten Commandments, the first four commandments, um, are all to do with the worship of God. How can we approach God? How can we love God? This holy God, now that we've been called out, how can we approach him? So the first commandment is that you should have no other gods. God's a jealous God. He wants us just to worship him. The second commandment is to make no carved image. We're not to worship God of our imagination. God who we would like to create. But we worship the God who's revealed himself through the scriptures. We don't make God up. He reveals himself to us. The third commandment, don't take the name of God in vain. We're to come and to reverence God. We're to fear God. We're to to hold him in high esteem, to worship him, not to speak anything that might profane him, not to say anything that might detract from him. And fourthly, we're to keep the Sabbath. This is part of what it means to come and, and to worship God. In the Old Testament, they'd blow the shofar to gather people to come to worship. Why would we need to do that? Why were the particular times when people would come and gather to worship? Isn't God everywhere? Well, yes, he is. But God's ordained it that to, to worship him. There are times when his people should come together to worship him, to honour him. So we read in, in the Old Testament that there were these set times, you know, feast days, there were daily sacrifices. But the Sabbath was, was key in the worship of Israel. The time to stop. Time to recognize the holiness of God. Time to recognize that they're a holy people. We need to recognize that we too are a holy people. I don't have any time. I'm not saying that because I'm busy. I mean, I am busy, but but I don't have any time because my life's not my own. The time that I have is the time that God's given me, and God's given me that time to live for His glory. And God has set out here to the to Israel on Mount Sinai that one day in the week. They stopped, recognized that they're a holy people, recognized the holiness of God, recognized that they didn't belong to themselves, but they belonged to the Almighty, and just stopped as a time to worship Him. So as we see our society and m many in the church downplaying the, the wonder and the glory and the privilege and the blessing of having one day in seven to stop and to worship God. To stop on a Sunday, to gather together as God's people. We live in a society that's increasingly trying to erode that and trample over it. Even in the church, people think, oh, why do we need to bother? We can meet any time and just, you know, we can meet up with Jesus by ourselves, on my phone, whatever. 
But that move to downplay a day, one in seven, is really a move to downplay something of the holiness of God. So that's the first reason why they're told to keep the Sabbath, because it's holy for you. The second reason is to remember God's work in creation. Have a look at verse 17. It is a sign forever between me and the people of Israel that in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So people often react against any talk about the Sabbath and say, well, you know, it says here again, it's given as a sign between God and the people of Israel. It's an Old Testament thing. It's part of the Mosaic Covenant. And yes, it was. The key sign of the Mosaic Covenant was the Sabbath. It's there clearly. But the problem is, is that it didn't originate with Moses. Genesis chapter 2, verse 3. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. That's the first mention of anything being made holy in the Bible, is that God set apart one day in the week, marked out to be holy. And he blessed it. Hmm. See the connection? A holy people, worshipping God in a holy way, will always receive a blessing. It's to our detriment when we try and downplay God's commands and try and move away from, from, from his standards. It's always to our detriment. But when we honour the Lord, when we worship him, when we obey him, we will be blessed. We've got a world that's trying to operate 24-7. It annoys me if I order a parcel and they come and knock on on a Sunday and I'm like, I don't need it. I only ordered it last night. I don't need it Sunday afternoon. Just don't. Come back tomorrow. It'll be good. Yeah? We've got society that's just trying to push and erode. Make every day the same. But can you see what they're doing? This, was given, this is given to the whole of mankind in Genesis chapter 2. There's a sense there that we need to rest as human beings. It's a blessing to us. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. We're not to serve the Sabbath. The Sabbath's there to serve us as human beings. And it's given to the whole of mankind. It's a blessing. We need it. Different societies have tried to change it, maybe working on a 10-day week. It's never worked out. This is the principle. This is the pattern that God's got for all mankind, that we need to stop and rest, even in ourselves, just to recuperate from work. To bring order to our lives, to that rhythm to life, the weekly rhythm, it's God-ordained. It's within the very fabric of the whole of creation. But can you see, as we increasingly live in a, in a, a world that doesn't believe that God's the creator, why would they bother setting a day apart to remember God's creation? But we believe that God's the creator, don't we? And what a privilege it is to, to set a day apart and to, and to stop for a day, if nothing else, and to realise that we are creatures, not the creator. To realise that our strength and energy goes so far, but then it stops. And we need to recognise that God's strength and energy never runs out and it, it can completely uh, fulfill everything that he's got. To stop and recognize that as we're creatures, that our life is brief. I read these words at the funeral on Friday. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field, for the wind passes over it and it's gone, and its place knows it no isn't it good to stop and realize that you're not it? You never were. God's it. Isn't it wonderful to realize that you can be replaced? 
that one day you'll go. And where you were, it's like the wind blows over. The grass comes. And no one remembers you. Isn't it good to humble ourselves? Doesn't it take away the stress and the strain? We've got problems in our lives and you think, I must work harder, I must try and fix it. It stops all that. Because you're disciplined to stop and to think, it's not about me. It's about him. I need to put my faith in him and him alone. That's the second reason, to remember that God's great work in salvation. But the key um, verse here, the key reason is tied in with this name of God. Verse 13, above all you shall keep my Sabbaths, that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. Got to tread lightly here. Whenever you start talking about the Old Testament law and Sabbath, things like this, you've got to tread very lightly because you don't, well, I certainly don't want to, but we don't want to come under legalism in the sense that you do things to get right with God. People often react, this is one of the great things, you know, you mentioned the word Sabbath, oh no, we're free now in Christ. I don't want anything to do with that legalism. And we don't want anything to do with legalism. But if you notice the reason here for stopping and obeying the command, it's not to get right with God. It's to actually acknowledge and to recognize that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. So any... Sabbath observance, any setting out of any day in a special way, in that way to take rest in God, it should never be about trying to get right with God. And that wasn't the heart of it. The heart of it was to recognize that it's God, Jehovah Kedesh. He's the one who sanctifies us. We could never do it. We know that, don't we? And I'm sure it's, it's definitely not written as comedy, but I do find it quite amusing that straight after this, you then get the incident of the golden calf. That mankind are showing that they can't get right with God, they can't be holy. Left to their own devices, they just fall into sin. Yeah? But they need to stop and remember that it's the Lord who makes us holy. There's a warning in this, about the Sabbath, which actually is a warning against legalism itself. Verse 14, everyone who profanes it, the Sabbath, shall be put to death. Whoever does any work on it, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. So in some ways, that's, that's a picture of what it looks like to try and get right with God through legalism through trying to do the right thing or abstain from certain things before God. It's our efforts trying to get right with God. The works that we do, if anyone was to work on the Sabbath, they were to be killed or to be cut off from God's people. Because they're forgetting that it's the Lord that makes them holy. It's not them that makes them holy. We see this most clearly in the Day of Atonement in Leviticus chapter 16. Um, let me just read it. It says, You shall afflict yourselves and shall do no work, either the native or the stranger who sojourns among you. For on this day shall atonement be made for you to cleanse you. You shall be clean before the Lord from all your sins. So that was the day when Israel's sins were washed clean. The slate was clean for another year. But did you notice there's only one person was allowed to work on the Day of Atonement, and that was the high priest. Everyone else had to cease from their labors. The Sabbath reminds us that salvation is of the Lord and of the Lord alone. So we see in the Sabbath a beautiful picture of redemption. And it's, it's here within the Ten Commandments. 
in Exodus, when it's talking about the, um, the Sabbath itself, Exodus 20, um, the reason given is six days of creation and God resting. That's the reason why it's given in Exodus 20. When it's repeated in Deuteronomy chapter 5, a different reason for keeping the Sabbath is given. Let me read it to you. You should remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. And the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your, your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath. So the reason in uh, Exodus 20 is to remember that God created and then he rested. And the reason in Deuteronomy chapter 5 is because the Lord brought you out of Egypt with a mighty hand. So the two reasons are there back in that we've already seen in our text. One, to remember that God's the creator. And secondly, to remember that God is the redeemer. So we see God's work of redemption, which is shadowed in the Exodus, shadowed in, in God reaching into Egypt and pulling out a people with his mighty arm. But it's fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ through him coming into the world to win a people through his death and his resurrection to bring people out from this sinful world to his holy presence with a mighty arm to grab them and to bring them out. This is the a thing that we remember in the Sabbath. And interestingly, when we think of Christ's work, that final week of his life, after saying that it's finished on the cross, He's buried and he rests in the grave on which day of the week? On the seventh day of the week. So. The work of redemption had been done and so he rested and on the first day of the week he comes back to life. You know, number seven speaks about completeness. We see in Genesis that God rested on the seventh. There's a sense there that creation was complete and so God was able to rest. And when you read through the accounts, you know, there's this pattern as we read Genesis chapter one, you know, that God got the six different days. But on the seventh day, we, we don't read there was evening and there was morning, the seventh day, as we do for all the other days. There's a sense there that God had created things perfectly. And in a sense, it created the essence of the Sabbath. The perfect creation with mankind in the right spot, enjoying all the good things that God's created with God and it, there was no and there was it morning and evening evening and morning and then the, you know, the seventh day there was no end to it it would have continued forever if sin hadn't come into the world but because sin came into the world the creation's frustrated that's why the Lord needed to bring redemption and the whole plan of redemption is the Lord trying to recreate in a sense or bring back that which was lost in Eden but he's going to bring it forth in the new heaven and the new earth so when Christ rests in the grave in a sense that his, his work of, of, sal of atonement is finished what he needed to do so that he could redeem the world is finished and as he rises on the first day it's a picture of this new creation is coming forth this new heaven and the new earth will come forth. We will be part of this new heaven and new earth. We will rest in him at our Sabbath rest for the whole of eternity. This is what the Lord Jesus Christ was bringing back. Why do you think he did so many miracles on the Sabbath? It wasn't just to wind up the religious people. Well, it might have had an edge to that. But in a sense, what he's, he's saying, he's saying, I'm bringing back Sabbath rest. That which had been destroyed in Eden, I'm bringing it back. 
And the Sabbath is, is a joy. It's a blessing. The Lord's coming and he's healing and he's delivering. He's setting people free. He's forgiving people. He's drawing people into his kingdom so that they might enjoy that Sabbath rest. And that's the great promise that we have in Christ, is that through faith in Christ we can enter that rest now. Jesus' famous words in Matthew 11, Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's the rest that every soul needs, to rest in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our Sabbath rest. As we're reminded in Hebrews, it says, Hebrews chapter 4, So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works, as God did from his so we come and enter that rest. We can enter today through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That which had been disturbed, the rest which had been disturbed in Eden because of sin. We can have it in our hearts through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And one day, will come into his presence, the new heaven and new earth, and enjoy that rest, the fulfillment of the Sabbath rest that Christ has won for us throughout the whole of eternity. So the question comes, am I just being a legalist encouraging us to, to set apart Sundays for the worship of God as a day to, to stop and to, to be still before God? To gather with his people. Surely if we've got the rest now in Jesus, then you know, wherever we go, we should be at rest. If Christ is the fulfillment of the Sabbath, which he is, and through faith in him we've already entered that rest, which we have, then surely I don't need to, to go around observing a day of rest, do I? The lesson comes of the name Jehovah Kadesh is repeated in the book of Leviticus. Exodus speaks about God's people being redeemed, brought out of slavery. Leviticus particularly is, now that you're redeemed, this is how you're to walk with me. Same for us. Now that you've been saved, you don't, no one gets saved by coming to church on a Sunday. No one's ever been saved that way. There's only one way of salvation, and that's turning from your sin and believing that Christ died for it and receiving his forgiveness, receiving the Spirit of God and being born again. That's the only way to be saved. But now that you're saved, now that the people have been redeemed, the the, the Law still comes through with Israel because it's to remember that God's the one who makes you holy. It's part of the way God set it up. As human beings, we need a rhythm to life. We have day, we have night, we have weeks. But there's something about setting a day aside to recognize these things, to recognize the holiness of God to recognize that he's the creator, to recognize that he is our redeemer. Those passages in the New Testament that people often quote in defense, like, you know, what about the Sabbath being a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ? Or what about turning back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world? Observing days and months and seasons and years. 
What about one person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike? What about those things? Doesn't that cancel out any recognition of, of setting a day apart in the, in the week for the worship of God? Well, I think the warnings there are, are trying to come back under the Jewish system, obeying all the rules. But the Sabbath, as I've said before, it goes further back than that. It goes right back to the very essence of creation. If you're observing the Sabbath to try and get right with God, to try and please God in, in a wrong sense, we want to please God, we want to worship him, but to try and please him like, oh, you know, I must try harder, I must try and attend church more to get right with God. If you've got any of that mindset, then I'm afraid you need to repent of that. That's not the gospel. But if you know the gospel, if you know that the Lord Jesus Christ has sanctified you, has made you holy, then surely there's nothing legalistic about having a time in the week where we reset our lives, where we realize what the main thing is in our life, that our lives are about the Lord where we come together and we encourage each other as brothers and sisters, where we sing God's praises, where we remind each other that we're creatures, not the creator, that we're dependent upon him. We come together to pray and express our dependence upon him. We come and we look in the scriptures and we see what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us, the redemption that is won for us, the glories that are to come. Is it legalistic to come and to have a taste of heaven now? Is that legalism? Is it legalistic to, to have a blessing because I know that I'm with my brothers and sisters worshipping him? To know that I need rest in my soul. I need to be fed by the Lord Jesus Christ. And yes, I can walk with him every single day of the week and know that he's my Sabbath rest, and I do. But is it legalist, legalistic to stop? And to feast upon him. God tells me to do it. It gives me the, an excuse to do it. You don't have to feel guilty. Oh, I've got so many jobs to do. I should be doing this. He says you'll be blessed if you do it. Is that legalism? I don't think it's legalism. I think it's joy. To glory. It's great to come together as God's people. You know, we've lost something of, in our days, of Sundays. You know, there used to be a campaign, you know, make Sunday special or whatever, and, you know, that, it's got its own agenda in, in one sense. You can't force that upon the non Christian. But even in the church, this, you know, it's been, Sundays have been downplayed, haven't they? The Lord's Day. Many churches have just squashed it into the Lord's Hour, and then we're going to go off and do what we want to do. It's the Lord's Day. I encourage us this morning, don't let the world rob you. That's all it is, you've been robbed of blessing. Don't let the world rob you. You know, something that the reformers had rediscovered, really, and it come through in their confessions and, and catechisms. I just want to read you something from the Heidelberg Catechism of 1563, which you probably know very well, I'm sure. Yeah? But just to, it captures in some ways the essence of, of the Lord's Day. What a joy it is. Let me read it to you. So catechism, if, if you don't know, it's, it's a series of questions and answers. Yeah? What does God require in the fourth commandment? Is the question. In the first place, God wills that the ministry of the gospel and schools be maintained. So it's not to say that in resting we do nothing. We continue meeting together for gospel ministry. The schools there, probably a reference to like Sunday schools, training the kids up in the things of God. 
you know, the command was to stop from our own works, but not from God's works. Yeah. So God wills that the ministry of the gospel and schools be maintained, and that I, especially on the day of rest, diligently attend church to learn the word of God, to use the holy sacraments, to call publicly upon the Lord, and to give Christian alms. In the second place, that all the days of my life I rest from my evil works, allow the Lord to work in me by his Spirit, and thus begin in this life the everlasting self. Setting apart a day a week helps us to know the work of Christ within us and gives us a great hope for the future that uh, we will enjoy the everlasting Sabbath. So we are a holy people. May encourage us to take the time that the Lord commands. Jehovah Kedesh, the one who makes us holy. Let's take time to worship him and to rest in him. Amen.